I Remember Palahaxie by Michael G. Coney. So this video is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to have to assume that you've read the first book in this series, which is called Rax in the U.S. or Hello Summer Goodbye in the U.K. Now, I'm going to break this video up and there's going to be some timestamps in there. I'm going to go over the, some introductory information. And then the second part of this video is going to be spoiling a lot of the major reveals and things that happen in this book. And then in the last part of the video, I'm going to try to entice you to read the second book, I Remember Palahaxie, and it's going to be spoiler free because I, I just really love both of these books. They, they just have the, a very similar tone. There's this love story in both of them. Michael G. Coney's writing is really amazing. There's a lot of mysterious things that happen in this book that get completely fleshed out and some new things introduced in the second book that I think makes it almost equally as good as the first book. I, I'm not quite sure I liked it all, all, completely as, as much as I liked the first book. This one just kind of came out of nowhere and I just really loved everything about it. The second book is is right there with it, but I think I still like Rax a little bit better. So let's just get into a little background on this one. So Michael G. Coney died in 2005 and a little bit before his death, he, I guess, had written this sequel, I Remember Palahaxie, and he decided to give it away for free on his website before he passed away. And there's kind of an introduction, and you can still find people online that kind of had maybe saved some of his journal entries or his blog entries when he did this, but I believe his website is gone now at this point, and you can't really find the free copy through his website anymore. Although, I did find a site that linked a PDF that I think was the copy of the original book that he gave away for free. But then a couple years after his death, there's a small press publisher called PS Publishing who, you know, bought the rights to this book and the first book, Hello Summer Goodbye, or in the U.S. called Rax. And they put together a really nice deluxe two-volume slipcase set, and they did a really good job with it. It's sold out through their website, but... You can find it on the secondary market. The, the box set, I think, is anywhere from like $120 US and up. And through PS Publishing's website, you can also buy the, both ebooks for, for both of these books. And I had the, the DAW paperback for the first book, but I bought the, the ebook through their website for this second book. I remember Palahaxie, and I believe it's the only place you can purchase the ebook for that book. So, you know, there's a lot of introductory stuff in this book. The um, the person they got to do the introduction, the introduction by Coney himself. It's it's really great. puts a lot of information out there. puts it into context. He, you know, Coney talked about that this book only took him three weeks to write the first book in this series. And he felt like he never really had a need to write a sequel. He, he said he felt like he said everything he wanted to say. But I think this story kind of stuck with him and he decided to go back and write a sequel. And I'm glad he did because it has that, like I said, it has that same tone, the feeling, the love story, the political intrigue. But he also solved some of the mysteries that were in the first book. And sometimes leaving those mysteries open and letting the reader kind of create their own outcomes is good. And sometimes when an author comes along and describes things, it can ruin a story, but I don't think that's the case in this one. I like the way he wrote most of the second story here, the second book. I don't think I like it quite as much as Rax. There's maybe a few convenience things that he put into this book, but that's just kind of speculation on my part, and I'll get into a little bit, get into that a little bit later. But now let's just kind of go into the spoiler section for Rax. And like I said, please, if, if you have any 
thoughts of reading this book or you're on the fence, go back, watch my video. I'll post it down in the, the description. Try to get you to read that one. It's one of the, my favorite books that I've read this year. And if you've read that and you're on the fence of reading the second book, then, then this video is for you. So now when we, when I first talked about this book, I, I mentioned a scene in the beginning where our main character drove and his aunt were caught out in the cold on this alien planet. And these, these aliens have these, has, they have this like irrational fear of the cold and it drove his aunt mad. And our main character, he saw these Lauren, who is kind of this beast-like, almost Bigfoot-like creature on the front here. And he saw them and thought maybe they could somehow help him make it through the cold and get back home. And he kind of almost blacks out in a way. And the next thing he remembers is this Lauren carrying him back home, which is kind of the scene we've, we've got here on the cover. And that sets up kind of the, one of the main big reveals at the end of the book. And so it's kind of important to kind of set that up in the beginning. I think Coney did a really good job kind of foreshadowing and teasing you with that. But then you kind of get sidetracked on this whole political thing that happens in the first book because there's two nations on this planet who are at war. The planet is basically just broken up into two continents. Each one has their own nation, and they had been at war for a long time. And our main character drove, his dad is kind of a high-ranking official for the nation that they live in. And they're going to Palahaxi, which is this coastal kind of vacation town, to hang out. But you also kind of realize that there's something else going on. His dad has some business to attend to, and there's this cannery that is that is a very key place and a plays a key role in in the first book and his dad has some stuff going on there and what we start to realize or what happens is you find out that the the two nations really aren't in war it was kind of a front set up by the officials of these nations and what they're actually doing is they're colluding together and they're setting up this cannery as like this big doomsday bunker because they've been, you know, they're, they're getting some technology. They have started using telescopes. They started watching all the planetary movements and everything that's going on there in their star system. And they realize that there's something that's going to happen that's going to set them into about a 40 year deep cold spell. And so they're setting this cannery up as a bunker to try to wait this 40-year cold spell out. And so once we start figuring that out, it's about halfway through the book. And one of these, these uh, another member of this, this political faction starts taking Drove in because he sees Drove as kind of intelligent and he can kind of think outside the box compared to most of the other inhabitants of this world. And he describes the the movement of the planet and there's this picture in here. It's probably hard to see, but if you have the book and you read this, it's one of the big reveals where the the official is not only talking about the unique orbit of the planet and the way the axis and the rotation of the planet goes along as they rotate their main star, which is PHU, so maybe Fu. I'm not exactly sure how you would pronounce that, but let's just call it Fu. And that's the, the star that's actually active and it has heat. Now there's a lot of talk about this being a binary system. Even on the back, it's, it's mentioned. But everyone in the book, all the aliens, they, they talk about this other body, Rax, as a, a dead planet or a cold, icy planet. But it could really only be a dead star that's in a binary system with the main star. And so our, our, the people in this, in this alien world figured out that after however many hundreds of years and generations that this icy star or planet, whatever you want to call it, Rax, starts tugging the 
the planet that all of our aliens are on away from the star that's giving them the, the warmth and the heat and everything. And this happens for about 40 years before it lets its icy grip go and, we, and our planet kind of goes back into its normal rotation around the sun. And so this is like a, a big reveal and what you kind of start to find out is that this resets the civilization of this planet. They, they get however many generations in, they go through one of these events, it kind of sets them completely back and that's why they've never really progressed past the stage of like a steam engine or something like that. They're kind of stuck in the Iron Age leading into like steam engines and stuff like that. And so that's kind of the, the first big reveal that happens and you, you start to realize that our main character is gonna be part of this bunker and he's gonna be allowed in and and he's gonna be, you know, what they think he's gonna be part of the people that are gonna inherit this this new world and hopefully allow civilization to not be set back again. Now, there's this love story going on along the, this whole time with Drove and his girlfriend Brown Eyes. And she's just kind of a commoner from this, this town. And she is not going to be allowed inside the bunker. And they get separated towards the end of the book. And Drove, he's inside the bunker, but then they, the people inside the bunker basically start turning on themselves and they start sectioning off different parts of the bunker. And you realize that Drove is going to be cast out. Even though this bunker was supposed to be set up for enough people, they panicked, they did whatever, and they sealed themselves off in the lowest reaches of the bunker. And he's going to be left to basically, you know, he's going to be on his own. So he kind of takes a leap of faith he leaves the bunker, it's winter, he doesn't know what's going to happen to him exactly, but he has this weird feeling that there's something going on with the Lauren. And at the end of the book, you get the, the hint that this Lauren comes up to him and it's going to take him and let them kind of sleep in a way through this 40 year ice, ice like, you know, generation when the Lauren are near them, they don't really age, it seems like. And so they could wake up completely fine. Maybe they've lost a lot of their memories, but this is the actual true way to live through this, this icy grip that Rax has on the planet. The people in the bunker, it seems like, are probably not gonna make it. And that's the impression you get at the end of the book. There's still a little mystery of how exactly this works with the Lauren. But that's kind of the, the ending of the book. And it's it's done really good. If if I, I probably missed some, you know, in, intricacies of the plot, I kind of wanted to make this brief. But those are some of the main things to set up for the second book. So let's just kind of get into the second book now called I Remember Palahaxi. So when you start this book out, you realize your generations and generations past this event that happened. And Drove and Brown Eyes are basically almost mythological people. And there's this, this remembrance in a way of them, but it's all very mysterious. And so you realize that humanity did sprout back forth through them and anyone else on the, on the planet who sought this comfort with the Lauren. And these people that try to save themselves in the bunker, that probably didn't work. And and this planet is now kind of under um, the ancestry of Brown Eyes and Drove and whoever else was with them at the time in this area of the planet. There's a couple other things that are added into this one. Uh, humans are now on the planet. And so we differentiate the humans with the aliens, which are called Stilks. I don't even, I'm not even sure we get the name Stilks in this book. It might have been in there, but since there was no other alien races, they just talked about themselves as, as themselves. But these humans are on the planet doing human things. You know, they, they need some resources for their, you know, galaxy-wide exploration. So they set up a mine and they're mining the planet for some resources and they're 
just giving the, the Stilks enough, like, technology and stuff to kind of help them out a little bit, but they kind of have this policy to not interfere with their own evolution and whatnot. So they're there, they're, they have kind of a friendly agreement, they're mining and they're, they're just kind of helping out the, the alien population a little bit as needed, but they're trying to stay completely hands off. Now, the other thing that's, that's introduced in this book is this idea of star dreaming. And it plays a really big role in this book. And what it is, is when, if you, whether you're a, a boy or a girl on, in this alien species, you, you, get to, you can go into the, the state of star dreaming, and it can be induced in a couple different ways. You can smoke this herb and get into it, but there's other ways to get into it as well. But you're, you kind of dream back through all of your ancestral memories, but only on the side that you are. So if you're a boy and you're learning to star dream, you go back through your dad, then your grandfather, then your great-grandfather, and you can relive and recount all of their, their, their memories, basically. And it's a very important thing that happens. And even the, the way the towns and everything are set up, the people that can star dream back the furthest are the ones that are in charge of their towns or villages or whatnot. So it's very important and it's set up, you know, it's differentiated by the sexes. And there's this other part of it that it's called, it's G-E-A-S, I think G-S. And it's a way for someone to kind of hide some memories. So if you do something and you don't want your ancestors to, you know, like your ancestors in the future, you don't want them to see this part of, of your life for, for one reason or another, you can put it behind this gias and kind of hide it. And when your, your future generations are going back and star dreaming through your memories, they'll come across this and they'll see that you kind of put up this wall in a way around these memories. And they're supposed to always respect this and not dig, even though they know they could probably dig through and see these memories. So those are a couple concepts that are new to this one and they're thrown out, but you get a lot of the same style writing. There's this love story that kind of spans throughout the whole book. You have a main character from one town and um, his girlfriend in another town, and it's kind of this forbidden love. These, these towns aren't supposed to mingle. They're not supposed to have relations with each other. They're, they have derogatory terms for one another. And so this love kind of sprouts up between this, these two towns. It's almost like this forbidden love. You know, the, the way the book is written is really cool too. It's in the first person from our main character, but it's like he's explaining this to a human. So it's, it's pretty interesting. A lot of it is him just telling the story, but there's many parts where he's distinctly explaining certain things and how their lives and their ideas and everything is different from humans. So now that we have humans on the planet, we can kind of differentiate some of their attitudes and their philosophies and all of these kind of things. And our first person narration kind of gets into that and it's done in a pretty interesting way. So it's really good. But the, the overall kind of plot with this one, besides having the love story, we also have kind of another political battle going on between these two towns. And our main character, his dad, is kind of like second in command in this town. And our main character's uncle is the one who is in charge of the whole town. And there's a lot that goes on between them and there's a whole kind of, you know, political uh, relationship, family dynamic battle going on through this whole thing that's, I thought, pretty entertaining. There's also this, this idea with the humans mining the planet and, and what's going on there. And we're at the point in this, in this future of this planet where we're getting close to another one of these 40-year cold spells. And so the weather is starting to get worse and worse 
crops are failing, it's harder for people down at the coast to fish. There's all these things that are happening once again that are leading to this next rotation of racks where racks is going to come and pull the planet into another icy 40 year winter. Now the coolest thing in this one is we get a lot more information about the Lauren and how exactly they survive through these cold spells, how they live through them. You get a little bit of information about this kind of, you know, this, you kind of, the, the people who are near the Lauren, they, they're just docile. They, they, they feel very at ease and they lose track of time. And so a little bit that of that's explained, how they survive, and then where they came from, the potential of where both of these alien species came from, both the Stilks and the Lauren. They're on this planet, and is it by chance did they evolve here? Or is there perhaps something else going on there? So you get a lot of these things answered, and I thought it was all done really well. I'm not really going to go over pros and cons. I, I think all of my pros st still kind of hold up for the first book, Rax. This, this book was very similar. The, the love story, the, little, the political intrigue, the mystery around the lore, and a lot of it was the same, except we got this, you know, the humans on there, and we got this idea of star dreaming introduced, which kind of let him do a sequel that is very similar, but introduced some new ideas. The only cons I'd really have for this one, um, you know, th this did feel like a little bit more of a mature book. It got a little darker than the first book. Th my only sort of con for the first book was that at times it felt a little YA, but I don't even really think that's a con. It was just, you know, written from the point of view of an adolescent. So you just kind of got some of that aspect of, of his coming of age and everything. But the, the second book here, my, my only real con is I really wonder if, if Coney had these ideas thought out, how he explains all of this stuff, or if it's just he used kind of a convenience to come up with some ways to tie up these loose ends and some of the mystery he put in the first book. Either way, I thought he did a really good job with it, but... I probably didn't like it quite as much as the first book, but I mean, it was right up there. I think this is still a five-star book for me, but Rax was just one of those upper five-star books in my opinion. So that's all, that's all I'm going to really talk about in this video. I really like this, this whole story so much that someday maybe I would do like some sort of deep, well-written um, scripted explainer video of both books together, but that would probably have to happen after another reread through both of these books, which I would love to reread these at some point because I loved them so much. So that's about it for this video. Up next, I'm reading Odd, Odd John by Olaf Stapleton. So just look for that video coming out next. And once again, thanks for watching.